I mean, there's no doubt that this is an act of war. Uh, it's not just a war, an act of war by Russia against Ukraine, but against the entire international community. Uh, I will say, however, that if you actually look in recent days on global wheat prices, they have actually come down quite a bit uh, in, in recent days, perhaps in anticipation of uh, this accord. But again, uh, this is essentially Russia implicitly using the weapon of hunger uh, to target different regions of the world and essentially sow discord uh, to presumably try to uh, weaken any Western support for Ukraine in the coming weeks and months ahead. I mean, we heard uh, the UN uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres and equally the uh, Turkish president yesterday speaking about how this is likely to ease uh, things financially, certainly in terms of this threat uh, to global food security. Uh, walk us through what allowing grain out of Ukraine is, is likely to do. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, Ukraine is a major, you know, traditional exporter of particularly wheat, but also other food commodities. Uh, and there are obviously in other parts of the world because of most likely climate change related weather emergencies on the Horn of Africa. We, you know, not too long ago had a severe heat wave in India. So there are parts and regions of the world where Ukraine, you know, supply typically plays a significant role in the local food supply that will be desperately dependent on this. It's another issue is that Ukraine traditionally is a major supplier also to UN World Food Program and other relief agencies. So when we're talking about the access and availability of emergency food supplies from, you know, humanitarian assistance and other other agencies, this will undoubtedly, you know, were the uh, blockade to be lifted, have a major positive effect. I mean, how much uh, reconstruction is going to be needed to Ukraine's infrastructure to put it back where it was in terms of supplying, as you said there, at the global market uh, for grain? Well, I think the reality is that you not only do you need, uh, I mean, first of all, you need a ceasefire and, and most likely a permanent uh, peace treaty. You need an end to the war. Uh, for Russian, uh, you know, aggression to not have a material negative impact on Ukrainians' export opportunities. But then, yes, you also need reconstruction of individual, you know, grain silos and other critical infrastructure. But the, the basic issue is that if Ukraine is going to play the role that it did before the war, or for that matter, Russia itself, the war has got to end, not just as a frozen conflict, but as a fully negotiated uh, peace treaty. I mean, as you say, a ceasefire, uh, Jacob, is, is vital in all of this. I mean, can uh, Ukraine rely on uh, Western economies, Western commitments to help it in that reconstruction? Oh, there's no doubt that, that this will be forthcoming. I mean, uh, there was a few weeks ago a major donors and, and reconstruction conference in Lugano in Switzerland, where the Ukrainian government put forth its its uh, national reconstruction plan. Uh, you know, there was a sort of an all-inclusive target of about $750 billion uh, in various forms of support needed over the next number of years. Uh, obviously, Ukraine is now also a candidate country for EU membership. So there's no doubt that the very, the vast majority, and certainly in my opinion, the vast majority of future economic support to Ukraine for reconstruction, et cetera, will come from the EU because ultimately you are reconstructing and rebuilding Ukraine to be a prospective member of the EU.